go on to some abbreviated comments on a different area. To wit, on space and mobility. We've been talking about networks, and rightly so. Networks are, are extremely important in as mediators of behavior in terms of intervening in systems, in terms of giving access to resources, or leading to contagion and spread of influence, et cetera. But I want to talk about space. I want to talk about location beyond connectivity. Um, I've placed a model of for you that's called the um, environmental contamination model. Um, and I don't know if we're going to have time to go over it. I, I think I'll gesture at it. Um, those of you who are here, it would do, you do well to open it up in case we can run it here in the next few minutes. But I, I do want to weave this into a narrative. We can have space in our models locations represented where agents are fixed locations. We can also have them exhibit mobility. What do I mean by mobility? Anyone want to say? Movement in that space. And I, I don't want to presuppose that like whenever we have space, we have mobility. No, because there's some very interesting models that can have space without mobility. And they give rise to really interesting behavior. You have fixed agents, and things happen to them based on where they are in space. Maybe they have access to resources that are nearby them. Maybe they can be infected because of the people nearby them. We've already seen some of them, right? You remember the, where we had those networks that were connected locally in space? Remember the 2D network where they were connected with nearby people? But it's only with networks, right? Um, it may be that uh, they're, they're located in certain places that expose them to air pollution, right? Or expose them to heavy metal contaminants based on their location. And we don't have to impose on it a, um, a notion of, of, of mobility. Uh, having, having spatial space represent our models is, is very valuable um, in many cases. Um, gives access to, to resources or, or lack of resources. Um, you may approximate that they're just staying in place, but if they have a nearby park or a nearby grocery store that has good food, you, you can capture that or access to nearby education or what have you, a uh, physician's office, even if you don't explicitly simulate mobility in the model. Um, uh, you, you may want to capture uh, aspects of, you know, exposure in different places or intervene in certain places. And during the pandemic, you know, we were often asked about, you know, Regina versus Saskatoon versus Prince Albert versus cities in the north, for example, in planning intervention strategies related. Um, uh, so spatial behavior or spatial location is important. I want to show you a model that has had disproportionate impact as a stylized model. And in some versions of this class, I um, I actually have a whole lecture on stylized models, if anyone's interested. I, I may actually uh, point you to it. But if you go to example models, help example models, and you scroll down to uh, a model here, and uh, it is called the game of life down here. So you make sure you look for the T at the start of it. I think most, many people here are familiar with this. How many people have seen or heard of the game of life? It also goes by the name Conway's game of life. So this is what's known as a cellular automaton. So you have space divided up into squares. Mm -hmm. Each square is either empty or occupied. 
And there were rules governing how those patches, those, I'll call them patches, evolve over time. Um, those that are occupied may die. Those that are empty, these empty patches may get colonized by another. And whether or not a given cell dies depends on its neighbors. So I'm going to, so in this model, there is no movement between patches of agent. The agents are these, these uh, uh, places and these, these patches, okay? Um, and here we go, I'm going to call up and, and simulate this. Okay, now, You'll notice we put in red when a unit is occupied. We we have in yellow when it's not occupied. And there's a set of rules here that apply. And I'll, I'll post the slides, but basically if a cell is empty, it gets colonized if there are exactly three neighbors to it in the eight cardinal in the in the in the uh, eight. Eight main directions. So north, south, east, west, northeast, southwest, southeast, northeast. That if, if a cell is there and has three neighbors exactly, it's em if it's empty now and has three neighbors, it gets occupied, it gets colonized. Mm -hmm. If a cell is alive, has, has is occupied, and it has two or three neighbors, it stays occupied. But if it has fewer than two or more than three, so four, five, six, it dies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's test your understanding. So here we have three right next to each other. One, two, three. Let's consider the cell right down here and kind of the, the under underneath. Remember, it's connected to things in eight directions, right? North, south, east, west, and the, and the other four. So this cell, is it in the next time step? Is it going to be alive or dead? This kind of middle one that's empty here. Sorry? It'll be, it will become occupied because it has neighbor to its northwest, neighbor to its north, neighbor to its northeast. Are we comfortable with that? Is recording going on? Okay. Um, how about this cell right here on the far, the far right? Um, of the red wave. Um, okay. <laughs> so this this cell on the far right is that will that cell live or die or will it be occupied or not for the next time step? No. No, no, it will not. Because it has only one neighbor, right? And it needs two or three to be able to continue to live to, to be alive. So it will die. How about this one on the far side? Die. How about the one in the middle? Bye. Okay, so what do you think is going to turn into the next time step? So this is a, a, a model in discrete time. Some weeks ago, I asked you to review a video on different models of time, discrete versus continuous. This is a discrete time. All of these update in lockstep. What I mean by that is each figures out how it's going to update from the next state based on the current state, but it doesn't yet do it until everyone else has figured out how they're going to update, and then they all update at once. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of who updates first. No, no, no. They all update potentially at once. Okay, so what is this going to turn into? Yes, Babs. A vertical bar. A vertical bar. That's exactly right. And I, I think to, to illustrate this, I'm going to go and uh, it's, it's exhibiting uh, a, a manner of... Okay, here we go. I'm, I'm doing it in the wrong... Ah, okay. It's exhibiting a certain silicon truculence. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to step it here, and there we go. It becomes vertical. What is it going to do the next time step? It's going to go back to horizontal. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, hey, come on. Come on. Um, oh, I need, to, I need to go forward by one, not... Uh, run for one time step. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay. Hey. Okay. Oh, what? What in the world? Well, okay. You get the drift. Um, now, 
Is there any mobility here? Is there any cell that's moving around? No, there's not at all. Are there things which give the appearance of moving as a collective here? Yes, these things seem to move, right? Um, you could think of them as kind of a, uh, a unit and you see some behavior. In fact, uh, there was a nice illustration of a glider up there. Um, and now we're into a, a fixed, uh, a fixed uh, component. Let me see if I can frob any of these to do something more interesting. Um, alas, I, I was hoping I could arrange one to be a glider, but... Um, I'm not uh, artful enough to do that. There were, there, were there were a couple gliders that kind of transiently moved around. And maybe I'll just at the cost of, of running this uh, early on, um, I'll, I'll try to spot a glider, but they, they hit into obstacles to, um, there's a glider. There it is. And oh, it, it crashed. Okay, so this game of life, seems very arbitrary. It's a very stylized model. It does exhibit interesting spatial behavior without any movement, without any mobility. There is no movement of cells, but there is kind of emergent phenomenon that, that seems to exhibit spatial movement as a whole, right? Um, game of life. So when I was a young man, we had ones and zeros. And Game of Life was invented, I think, in the late 60s, early 70s. And this supposedly this was the biggest cycle user worldwide for a number of years was running Game of Life um, in different computer centers. Um, and I was not immune to that phenomenon. Um, uh, this is long before you folks were specs and cosmic cop. Um, uh, Game of Life has been the su subject of much scientific stuff. So how many people in here have taken a course in, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what it's called, machines and hierarchies, but you, you learn about things like regular expressions and finite state automata, yeah. down automata. There is a What is it, uh, 432 or something? Mm -hmm. So the Turing machines, so you have Turing machines at the top of the hierarchy, yes. push down atomic and context free grammars and yeah. regular expressions and fine oh, and 364 finite state automata. Are, 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 are some of you familiar with this? Okay, I'm gonna tell you the game of life is computationally universal. What does that mean? Anything you can you can run anything you can run on a Turing machine, you can run in the game of life. And researchers have built up computers and the game of life that will do computation. You can create an AND gate, a NAND gate, an OR gate in the game of life using gliders, <laughs> use gliders to communicate. And you can simulate programs. And anything you could write for a Turing machine, you could write in the game of life when people have done it. Mm -hmm. um, it is computationally universal. Now, Moreover, it exhibits this nice balance between complexity, a complex emergent behavior, and very simple rules. I gave you the rules earlier, right? You're dead, and you have exactly three neighbors, you become alive. If you're alive, and you have exactly two or three neighbors, you, you, uh, you survive. Otherwise, you, you know, the cell will come up. I shouldn't say really you become alive if you, but the cell is unoccupied. If it's empty and it's exactly free. Very simple rules, very, very complex spatial behaviors that can result uh, and can simulate uh, very, uh, very complex phenomenon um, in ways that, uh, that uh, continue to intrigue scientists. Um, and 
this is an example of a computationally interesting stylized model. The creator of cellular automaton, anyone know who it was? Who first experimented in serious ways with cellular automaton? It's a famous name in computer science. It, it turns out it wasn't Turing. That, that's an excellent idea, and I was right in that era. But it was someone of equal, of just about equal stature in computer science. Von Neumann. Anyone know the name Von Neumann? Okay, if if you might have taken two fifteen from the field. The von Neumann architecture, that's the main architecture for computers we use today on our cell phones, on this computer and the built-in computer there. Anyone's computers here uses the von Neumann architecture where we have a central processor, we have memory, we have input-output units. Central processor executes instructions that are stored in memory and stores data into the memory. That was formulated by the von Neumann architecture. And he was doing work with cellular automata as models of computation. And they retain interest because they're distributed models. You don't have a central processor. Computation is distributed across this. Computation goes on across the entire space. And in terms of heat generated, et cetera, there's less, there's less of a problem dissipating heat um, you can have transistors in many areas um, compute uh, compute across the space. This is a stylized model. But I did want to highlight that although models that are uh, that are have spatial uh, spatial context without mobility are of interest. Models that have mobility have. Um, a great deal of additional interest. And I think in the interest of time, with it being 45, 49 past, I will close my class now um, and just return to this uh, in the context of, um, of, our, of our next class. We'll talk a little bit about Asian mobility and uh, we'll look at what's called the Shelton segregation model, which is given Another stylized model that's given great insight into societally societal patterns of of disadvantage and segregation. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Thank you.